Clerk will call the roll. Lynn Whitley, Attorney Judge. Here. Roy Charles Brooks, Commissioner Precinct 1. Present. Devin Allen, Commissioner Precinct 2. Here. Gary Dickens, Commissioner Precinct 3. Here. Jamie Johnson, Commissioner Precinct 4. Here. Thank you. Our invocation this morning will be delivered by Minister of Discipleship, Johnny Drowan. That's close enough. This can't be. You know, you know, everybody, she keeps saying that. I said, well, I've got a uh, son that went to LSU and some friends <coughs> that were, um, grew up in Louisiana, so I understand the Cajun a little bit. Well, if he's from the LSU, he's got to be a smart man then. Well, yeah. he, and he is because he actually met his wife and married his wife, who also went to uh, LSU, but she's from Alabama, so, you know, it's just, uh, it, it's, it could be a tough life at times. Good. Welcome. Thank you very much for coming out today. Good to be here. Let's pray together. Father, it is an honor for me to pray for these men and women who have invested their lives, Father, in caring for people and understanding law and making decisions, Father, that will affect people for years to come, maybe even for a lifetime and maybe even forever. So I pray today, this morning, you give them wisdom that even supersedes their own wisdom that comes from you, Father. You told us in James chapter 1, verse 5, that if any man lacks wisdom, if we ask of you, you'd give it to us freely. And there's no consequences or decisions based upon that thought. So I pray for wisdom for this court as they make these really important decisions, Father, that will affect many people. We love you, Lord. In Christ we pray. Amen. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Honor the Texas flag. I pledge allegiance to me, Texas, one state under God, one and indivisible. Thanks again for coming out today. We're, we appreciate the invitation. <coughs> Mr. Manius. Thank you, Your Honor. Members of the Court, we have three um, comments or actions concerning the agenda itself and then two announcements. Uh, first on the agenda, under the administrator section, item A1, we have added into your red folder various presentations uh, that, uh, that you might want to look at. We'll have them up on the screen, obviously. Uh, and under the administrator's section, also item 8A7. This is a consent item. It's an ILA with the City of Arlington. There is a revised court communication in, uh, in that particular, uh, on that particular <coughs> issue in your red folder. Uh, the only change was, was that we had already encumbered the money uh, that we're asking you to approve to pay to the City of Arlington. It's a little over 24000 so we corrected the fiscal impact piece of that. On the agenda itself, members of the court, we're going to take things out of order once again this morning. Uh, when we get to the administrator section, uh, Your Honor, we only have two, uh, two individuals that wanted to address uh, uh, the court at that time. One is by the telephone and one is in person. I would suggest that we take them first before we get into uh, the administrator section. Uh, Ms. South will go ahead and lead uh, with, with a general overview. We'll have representatives from the Health Science Center here to make their presentation. And then we'll ask Mr. Tanasia to come forward and, and make his presentation. Also, in, in conjunction with that, uh, when we get down to the rental assistance piece of that, since we have a, um, an agenda item that is separate than item number one, when Ms. Camarino comes forward to make that presentation, she will have a slide program for you at that point. So uh, those are the comments as it relates to the agenda itself. Uh, the two other comments, <clears throat> at 2 o'clock today, the IT Steering Committee is meeting in the Family Law Center. Mm -hmm. and, um, and tomorrow at 2 p.m., uh, the PEBC is meeting, and that is a virtual meeting. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you. Court members, you have before you the minutes of our regular meeting of March the 16th. Move approval. Second. We have a motion to second. Any discussion? Please vote. Commissioner Johnson? Yes. Motion passes unanimously. Uh, we don't have any proclamations today, but uh, Commissioner Allen, do you have an announcement? Um, actually, I don't have an announcement per se. I do okay, have some thank comments you. that I wish to share. Nope. <laughs> you don't get away that easy. Well, normally I would share that. Um, this will be our week to host a COVID-19 town hall. Um, in this particular week, we had already planned <clears throat> to have some conversations with leaders 
in the uh, Asian community about anti-Asian racism and discrimination. Um, it's been an issue obviously long before COVID and in some ways has definitely, um, COVID has um, exacerbated those issues. Um, and we decided to hold off on having that town hall, especially given the tragedy in Atlanta. Um, I, I know that there was also another tragedy in Colorado, but, um, and I, you know, certainly, um, my heart hurts for those family members and the communities that are affected um, by that violence, but particularly for our Asian community here in Tarrant County. Um, I know and understand as a woman of color, um, one, you can't compare traumas, so I'm certainly not trying to do that. <clears throat> but I understand being afraid, being frustrated, being angry. Um, I hope that members of the Asian community in Tarrant um, find a supportive community, certainly. Um, my office, um, myself, I'm here to be supportive in any way that we can. So we are going to continue on with um, having the town hall, but we are actually gonna change the kind of format of it. And we wanna be really thoughtful about how we do that. Um, so please stay tuned for that. And I ask that we adjourn the meeting in honor of the victims of the tragedy in Atlanta, as well as in Colorado. Thank you. Uh, you know, I. I I know that we also up in Keller had a, we don't know for sure whether it was intentional or not, but we had an Asian American uh, gentleman who was uh, hit and, killed by a hit and run. And, you know, I, I hope, um, I applaud you for your town hall meetings. I think we have got to do something to try to bring uh, the country back together and to um, maybe reunite and certainly stop um, this seemingly um, racist opinion or feeling or actions that are, are being waged against any number of uh, different segments of Americans. And, you know, we truly are, and we've always been referred to as a melting pot. And I hope that we can get back to that and quit trying to find ways to separate and divide us, but to try instead to find ways to uh, bring us together and unite us. Um, enough is enough. True. Um, enough is enough. Um, the one other thing that I would like to just ask for y'all, um, West Texas Judges and Commissioners Association meeting is coming up in Odessa at the end of April. They are currently holding rooms, I think, for each court member. Um, if you will just let me know or let my office know whether or not you or anybody from your staffs are going to be going to that, then... If, there, if you're not, then we will release those rooms. And if you are, then uh, just know that they're there and you'll have to do that. Now, also from a standpoint of court, yeah. uh, we need to know that. I know that uh, I will be out the entire week. I will be going in as president at the end of the, at the week, uh, <coughs> that particular year. And I think, Commissioner Fickus, you're gonna be, I'm going. you're gonna be going also. So just <coughs> be sure and let, cause if, if one other goes, then we're, and maybe even with that, because I mean, it's, some of it's virtual, but it just let GK know so that we can figure out what, if anything, we need to do with regards to court. Well, you're going in as president of that organization. Maybe the best reason to go to beautiful downtown Odessa. <laughs> It's gorgeous, isn't it? <laughs> Especially this time of the year. The sand, the sand looks particularly nice this time of the year. Yes, indeed. Uh, I've got some announcements, okay. if, I, if I may, sir. And congratulations on another uh, leadership post for you in the firmament of counties. 
uh, in this nation. Uh, these are COVID-19 registration events that Precinct 1 has scheduled this past weekend. We did an event at the Potter's House Fort Worth uh, where we registered approximately 160 persons. March 23rd through the 25th will be at Tarrant County College South Campus. March 31st at the Miller Avenue Sub Courthouse. April 10th at Texas Wesleyan University. April 12th, Samaria Baptist Church, 4000 East Berry Street. April 15th and 17th, Tarrant County Trinity River Campus. April 19th, Como First Baptist Church. April 24th, El Rancho Supermercado. Yes. They were great partners for us. So yes. awesome. On the South Freeway in Fort Worth. And April 26th, <laughs> Great Commission Baptist Church on McCart Avenue. That takes us through the month, month of April. We've got four in May that we'll talk about in the future day. Thank you, Your Honor. Any other announcements at this time? It appearing to be none, then we will, uh, you have before you the consent agenda. Move uh, approval. Second. We have a motion to second. Any discussion? Please vote. Commissioner Johnson? Yes. Motion passes unanimously. I believe we have a public hearing today. <coughs> Good morning, Judge and Commissioners. Um, today we're requesting that the Commissioner's Court conduct a public hearing to consider the draft program year 2021 annual action plan for the Community Development Department. Uh, the public comment period opened on March 11th and ends today. Uh, we'll bring the results of that comment period to you next week with a request to approve that action plan. At this time, I'll open the public hearing and ask if there's anyone here wishing to speak to this matter. There appearing to be no one. I'll close the public hearing and we will come forth. There's no action required today, sir. Okay. Excellent. Thank you. Mr. Manius. Your Honor, if we could, now that we're at the, the point of the administrator section, if we could go ahead and... Uh, uh, hear from the two people who signed up for audience participation. So we have one that's by telephonic and the other is in person. Okay, uh, first we'll, I will call on uh, Blanca Martinez. If you would please come forward, Blanca. My name is Blanca Martinez. I'm a social worker by profession. I graduated from Dallas Baptist University and did gang, drug, and dropout intervention and prevention for many years. We did many studies, some of which were longitudinal. We had a great success rate, but I say that to say that I'm interested very much in research and what really works, what is effective. It look, may look good on paper, but in actuality, is it working? Is it effective? Is it changing the lives of our community? And the vaccines and the mask obviously is not. It's not based on enough science. I have a packet here for you. If you don't mind, I'm not going to go through it. We just had the Worldwide Rally Day, Worldwide global globally and from Ireland and from other countries they put together a packet that is just as parallel to the problem that we're having here in the United States the fear is that the vaccines were being pushed when there were not enough animal studies the animals they did study on died they all died 
died, and yet they continued. This is about the money. We have other alternative methods of dealing with this virus, some of which we've spoken about here before, ivermectin, hydroxychloroquine, butesidine, and I'm going to give you some web websites. Yesterday at a on Daystar Television, that you can go back and look at the archives, there was a program called That Scenes, Disaster Ahead. And on this program, which I have to admire the, the boldness and the courage that they've had to put the truth out there, even when there's so much opposition from the establishment, so much opposition from big pharma, from those that have something to lose, which is a whole lot of money. I have some, is it almost time? One minute. Okay, let me give you these websites. There is GeertVandenBosch.org. is one of the developers of the vaccine. He was a proponent at one time and now is in high opposition because of the deaths the, and the deaths that we don't know about in the future. G-E-E-R-T. B-A-N-D-E-N-B-O-S-S-C-H-E dot org. We also have butesidineworks.com, B-U-D-E-S-O-N-I-D-E-W-O-R-K-S.com by Dr. Bartlett, an emergency physician, highly acclaimed and, and worked very closely with our um, medical establishment here. And FLCCC.net, which is Dr. Corey's site, which shows a lot of the data, the studies, the, the information that is necessary to make and inform decision. Please consider these other alternatives and at least, at least put a halt to the vaccines. If they can do the vaccine so quick, then they could have done the hydroxychloroquine that quick and given out a pill to people that's not going to kill them. Thank you. Thank you. God bless. These are the packets for, for them if you don't mind. Thank you, ma'am. You're welcome. God bless. Next is uh, Robert Bucher. Robert, I'll be giving you a call now. Oh, oh, is it here? Uh, Mitch is being help you. Looking for a Hello. Robert Buker. Hold on one second. Hold on, please. Okay. At least now we know where it works. It's almost as good as our music. He didn't hear that. He's... No, I'll tell him not to bother. Okay, moving on along. Okay. Thank you, Your Honor. Members of court, we can now go to the administrator section on item number one. I'm going to ask Ms. South to address the court at this time. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. <clears throat> okay, let's get started here. So we'll start with our pillars. And this week, um, no substantial update, but I did want to talk about or make a quick note that at the end of March, the um, TDOM operated permanent testing locations, uh, those will start to close, some of them. Um, solely because just the number of individuals that are visiting those loca testing locations has decreased and because the volume of other, you know, the volume and the availability of other uh, testing sites is just so large, so people are not coming to these sites and the volume has dropped. 
So um, the first one to close will be the TCC South Campus, and the last day of testing for that location will be March 27th. And then the Arlington ISD will conduct its last test on March 29th. The remaining sites uh, will still be open beyond March, uh, and they'll operate on a week-to-week -week basis. Those numbers will be evaluated um, each week. They won't close those sites without at least a one- to two-week notice before uh, shutting them down. Are there any questions on that, comments? Um, if we see that the interest in testing increases, will we have the capacity to ramp those, the, the sites back up, or how's that gonna work? I'm not sure, honestly, GK. So we'll need to see, because the, the testing, the interest in testing is at our sites have, has diminished. And uh, we, when we spoke with FEMA and public health, it's the belief that that there are so many other testing sites now that are coming available and they're very quick to, uh, you know, you see them on almost every other block in the city. So, so if there's a demand, well, then an increased demand, well, then we'll either redirect or we will attempt to bring some of those sites up yet. But it's not our intent to bring those sites up because of the availability of testing oh, in other places. Okay. Okay. And then, as you can tell on the social services pillar, the, con the number of the active referral cases continues to rise, hopefully will each week. For the vaccination update, for a quick overall number, um, Tarrant County and its partner entities have administered 411,470 doses, with public health administering 190,033 of those. Uh, JPS is actually up to 58,347, with around 34,000 of those being first doses and almost 24,000 of those being second doses. And um, I know UNT is here today to give an update after me, so I just want to make a quick note that um, UNT, in partnership with the county, did open its first vaccination site this morning at 9 o'clock in the Stop 6 neighborhood um, at Brighter Outlook, uh, Inc., I believe which is uh, operated by the Ebenezer Missionary Baptist Church. It's my understanding that it went very well this morning, and that site has an initial goal of administering 1,000 shots in the first week, and it is by appointment only. And I'll let UNT elaborate once they get up here to present. Also, in addition to that, four sites have been added to the vaccine transportation program this week, including the new location at Ebenezer, THR Fort Worth, HEB, and Lake Worth locations. And a quick note for the HEB and Lake Worth locations um, is that Catholic, Char Ch Catholic Charities is servicing those two. Um, and we should have an update hopefully next week, uh, if not the following week, related to the ridership numbers for you all. Then, Do we have any ridership numbers for the previous weeks in some of the other locations, whether it be Arlington or not? I would assume that that's being gathered. I don't know that I have those numbers. Kristen, do you know? I have some preliminary numbers. They're not comprehensive to the entire program, but I'll get those for you for next week. Thank you. And then lastly, well, yeah, last, uh, I'm going to go ahead and skip to the map, but I'll refer back to this slide here in a minute. So um, on our weekly data for our call center map, um, we've added for you, Commissioner Allen, the top five zip codes by call volume down towards the bottom. Uh, we did flip-flop the top this week, so it switched from 76017, which I made a mistake last week and said 107. It is 017, and that has switched to 76063 now, uh, which is Mansfield area. How did 750 get in there? On the top five? N uh, number four. You sure that's not 76052? It probably is. Is well, it 75052? Well, that's Grand Prairie otherwise. I mean, it is Grand Prairie. Yeah, we do. So we do have callers from Grand Prairie that are calling, so that's. That's just as if they split it down. We'll simply check. Yeah, we will. It's very possible after looking through all of those zip codes that it could have got transposed. And then um, also there was a question asked of us about um, the top five reasons for call volume. So currently they're broken down into general sections. There's, I think there's four or five of them. It's like general calls, um, cancellations, reschedule requests. But if you look at those top general categories, actually the top number one category is cancellations. 
Your second one is requests for registration assistance and confirmation of their appointments. And then the last one are reschedule requests. We are working to kind of drill down a little bit. Um, we can go by precinct if there's anyone else that wants it divided down by their precinct to see um, you know, what the reasons are, the top drivers behind those calls. So if anyone needs that or wants that, I'll be happy to provide it if you'll just let me know. I think we all need that. Will do. Well, and I think originally that request, the question that came from Kelly in my mm -hmm. office, um, she's running point on all of the vaccine calls that our office gets. Um, and it, it was interesting to see that the top reason was cancellation request, which is good because mm -hmm. then that means that, you know, in all the work that we're trying to do to make sure that we keep a good, updated, clean data list that people are at least calling in to say that sure. they're not able to, to, um, to make their appointment. Um, I had a question that I've just forgotten, <laughs> of course. I love it. Oh, no, actually it was a concern. There was a constituent of mine who I think that um, Vinny and Public Health are working with him right now, but he had specific questions um, and he contacted the call center and his call was never escalated properly. So, and I think this has already been explained, but I want to make sure I understand if someone calls in and they have medical type questions, how should that be handled? So I don't, it, medical type questions, I don't think that related group, to the vaccine. Yeah, so I don't, if they have an appointment to get the vaccine. So in this case, um, the constituent called and his uh, appointment was reaffirmed or confirmed. And then he had questions specific to the vaccine, medical questions. He, his wife um, is having heart surgery soon. And so, you know, obviously uh, he was looking for some some uh, thorough answers. He was so looking his, for more detailed than the FAQ right. sheet. I understand. Yeah, and so essentially he was sent in circles. Okay. Um, Maybe we have some more. Yeah. Morning. Good morning. Um, there is an opportunity if they would like some additional information, especially health information, as you mentioned, they would escalate the call to a specific nurse line that we that TCPH does um, handle. And everyone at Group O has the different phone numbers to escalate to those specific um, escalations, whether it's it's a school tip, a health-related question, things like that. So they do have those numbers to escalate that call to. Okay, because uh, apparently the response that he was given was, we can't answer those questions. But do you have more questions, sir? So he would say, these are the questions I have, and they would say, oh, we can't answer those questions. So okay. I apologize, well, we can look into that. And I mean, and I have his name and his number. Okay. But I'd like to make sure that and I understand that other calls have been escalated, but, and maybe this is an isolated event, but I'm concerned if it's not. Absolutely, yes, yeah. and, and we can, I'll get back with Group O and okay. make sure that that's discussed and, and, and that doesn't happen again, okay. um, because they do have that information to be able to escalate that call back to the proper line okay. with TCPH. Good, thank you. Thank you. And then again, the last two slides are just our grant and our, um, Spend update and nothing substantial on either one of those. If y'all have any questions, I'll be happy to answer. You know, I don't know whether it's from you or of, of any, but I would just say this with regards to the call center. Mm -hmm. um, I have a feeling that as we move further along and we whittle down the list of folks on our white list, registration list, if we should get a, a significant increase in vaccines, that call center may become an appointment center. And we might at least sit down and at least begin thinking that if we get to the point to where we're getting more vaccines than we have people registered to send appointments to, that we may put out a statement now, I'm not even going to say it out loud, but that incur, you know, that we have another way of getting a vaccine. And so that those folks need to at least begin thinking about it, maybe working with UNT, whomever. But if we were to convert that to an appointment versus a registration call, then um, we just need to be prepared for that and not get caught off guard. We got about 54,000 vaccines this week. And so, you know, we're, we're in the ramp up stage. I think 
the Johnson & Johnson numbers are going to be going up uh, fairly strong over the next couple, maybe two to three weeks. So that means we could end up getting even more vaccines in here and um, I just want to be sure we're ready. Sure, we can have those conversations. Thank you. Thank you. Members of the court, if we can now move to uh, a presentation by UNT Health Science Center. Uh, Dr. Trent Adams is here to address the court at this time. Thank you, Mr. Maitis. Good morning, Judge Whitley, commissioners. Um, it truly is an honor to be here with you this morning to provide an update from the University of North Texas Health Science Center at Fort Worth. Um, we are today, my colleague Davis Mansorfer and I will be providing an update on the vaccine partnership between us and the county. We will be covering three areas. Um, first, the partnership, kind of revisit our goals and where we are on those um, as we've been um, moving forward on, this pro on the progress towards opening up the first site today. Um, the operational updates on um, the vaccine sites themselves. And then David will specifically cover the outreach and media campaign that has been launched. So first, um, I want to just to highlight that we've con we continue to work towards meeting the established goals. Um, as you know, the um, Tarrant County, okay. So as, as you know, the, the goals of the Tarrant County um, Health Department and um, UNT has been to remove barriers to increase registration and vaccination rates for all of Tarrant County. Um, to collaborate with community partners to educate residents, increase registration, and provide access to the COVID-19 vaccine for all Tarrant County um, residents. We want to prioritize specifically the um, outreach to hard-to-reach um, and vaccine-hesitant communities and making sure that we are successful in not only launching the first site as of today, but also as we move forward to open up additional sites in the coming weeks. Registration has been specifically a specific focus for us. Um, we've implemented tactics to increase registration to include offering um, a number of um, on-site registration opportunities for individuals who need registration support, working with the community to make sure that they have awareness of the call-in number as well as helping them to navigate the website, and using all of our community assets to conduct registration drives. We are working with our assets at the Health Science Center, our partners at um, OptumServe, and also working with community leaders such as United Way and the faith-based community to hold additional vaccine registration drives. Um, the communication and engagement and education continues. Um, we've looked at all the approaches to inform and support the community and getting the information, but also more importantly, to understand where all the vaccine sites are going to be launched in advance, help them to navigate the registration um, site itself, and also provide resources to those individuals who may not have access to the internet, smartphones or um, have transportation to be able to get to those locations when they do register. Next slide. Okay. So our, up, our operational update um, that I'm providing today is that we have established the um, potential vaccine locations throughout the county. We're creating a list. Um, David Mansdorf and I have been personally going out to do these site visits and doing the walkthrough, making sure that the the um, individuals that we're meeting with understand the purpose of the partnership between Tarrant County and HSC, but also understand that we want them to provide access to information and coordination to help us to get as many people registered as possible. Um, we've been emphasizing the importance, as you mentioned today, Judge Whitley, the vaccine um, availability. There have been a lot of questions about whether or not we will be able to keep these sites open for the allocated time that we've projected. And we have always relied on um, the fact that this is all vaccine availability um, driven. So as we get more vaccine into the, into the county, it's going to be important for us to coordinate with these sites to let them know how many um, vaccines are available and how, what, the, um, engage, what period of time the engagement will continue once the sites are open for business. Um, we've launched the Stronger Together marketing campaign, um, and we worked on this as a part of in collaboration with um, the, um, uh, the team here at the county. We have launched the social media campaign. We've developed the county kits, which um, are branded with both HSC and county logos. And we've created the um, community resource website. The micro site is live. Um, community programming, working through registration drives and listening sessions. Listening sessions are being conducted with our partners, OptumServe. They have experts in this field who are under trying to get an understanding of where the needs are what are the challenges and what are the barriers, as well as highlighting for us at HSC 
what are the components of the vaccine hesitancy that are driving some of the low registration rates in some of the underserved and hard to reach um, um, populations. Um, working with OptumServe has um, allowed us to provide end-to-end -end services for the vaccine, both the administration and the management services on site. Um, they have provided an inclusive healthcare professional team, logistics and the secure technology and other associated activities needed to coordinate the fixed site vaccination process. We were on site with them this morning, um, Commissioner Brooks and Reverend Datcher at the Ebenezer Missionary Baptist Church um, were able to also meet with the media and to provide some, some opening remarks and to engage with the community directly. We continue to meet with community leaders to get a sense of the needs and the resources available to support this effort. And we plan to continue to assess registration resources to ensure we provide access to anyone who wants to get a vaccine, um, preferably in their community. And we will continue to work with the county to support current and future registration efforts um, and education forms related to COVID-19 vaccine. I'll stop there. Um, now my colleague, David Mansdorf, is gonna be coming up to share additional guidance. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Okay, um, so uh, as you see, um, we have launched the uh, communications component to uh, what we're trying to do here on uh, the Stronger Together campaign, which is to really focus on the three areas, and that's to educate um, the public, establish trust, and create opportunity. Um, we listened to some of the feedback last time. Um, we are in the process of uh, attaining um, uh, photography from uh, residential leaders uh, to incorporate within uh, our, our plans. Uh, so uh, as we continue to update uh, our digital assets, um, they will come live on our microsite um, as you go. Um, as you can see, these are some of the um, social posts that are going to be available. We have them in English, Spanish, and Vietnamese, all three of which are going to be downloadable on the microsite. Um, uh, uh, you can see, uh, as we continue to get into this, um, we will have um, home base for promotional materials for a, a whole slew of things, everything from print, literature, um, but social media posts, flyers, photography, video, registration callouts, and uh, it will all have multiple languages. Again, we will make sure that we have a couple of pieces that can pivot into um, specific targeted languages like we I know we talked last time, like the Somali community, we'll be able to pivot some of our pieces um, into uh, languages that are outside of the top three most common here in Tarrant County. Um, uh, as for registration efforts, um, we have multiple registration efforts coming up. We have at least 13 planned um, through priority zip codes through May, and we're going to continue to work with community leaders to continue to target in addition to build capacity on what you all are currently doing as well, too. Um, just one um, note, we had uh, one event on 313, which uh, resulted in about a 15% uh, increase in that zip code uh, and registration. So again, as we continue to build on this. Um, there's some conversation about uh, the governor's announcements uh, in terms of who is going to have access soon to uh, and what the, um, the total eligibility would be. Um, so as we get that, it's going to get more important to register folks. Um, and again, uh, uh, we are working hand in hand with multiple community partners. Um, the lists of uh, churches that were uh, given to us, we've uh, already visited several of them um, to look at both sites, but also registration drives um, that we can pass um, some of our print material to and they can go out and um, help with registration um, to build capacity around that area as well too. And um, that's kind of the update for this week. I'm happy to take any questions. David, I have a... Um, yes, sir. At what point do you guys start working in the, in my particular area of Precinct 3? Um, our goal, so just to give everyone an, an update on the different sites that we're looking at right now, and they are uh, pretty well spread out. Um, we obviously have the site live in Stop 6. We have, um, we're looking at the Ridge Marmol area. We're looking at the Saginaw area. Um, we have a site up there that has some uh, potential. We have um, a site that we're looking at in the um, kind of Northern Keller area um, as well. And then we have one in Forest Hill, Como, and um, 
another, uh, a couple more, they're, they're not in the back of my head right now, but we're trying to geographically disperse them throughout the community based on the data points that we have for accessibility and need. I, I would appreciate it if you would maybe get with myself or somebody on our staff and kind of get some ideas from us on some areas because I know that Richland Hills is an area that you might want to look at, Watauga, um, you mentioned the Northern Keller, that's, my area is Northeast. Yeah. And um, I just, we hadn't heard from you. Um, uh, we're, we're open, um, as we've uh, mentioned last week, I'm happy to take any lists of potential sites that you all are interested in. Uh, it's Dr. Trent Adams, myself, willing to meet with, with anyone to continue to uh, get all aspects. We are vaccine contingent right now, again, um, it, we have been in conversation with both GK and Vinny on um, what the total capacity is going to be. So our goal is to um, make sure that we're not building too quickly um, to rob other areas that already have capacity. Well, again, I'm, I'm one fourth of the county. I just don't want to be ignored. Understood. And I'm gonna reiterate what I've said before, before he does. We need something in the Northwest, and that needs to be the next site that we open up. Understood. So David, the list that I provided you all a few weeks ago, um, and I have it here, can you tell me who you all have visited with? Because so far I haven't, the folks that we've heard from, who we let them know to expect a call from you all, they have not been contacted. Um, we were with Reverend Jones uh, okay. yesterday, um, and I believe that was the number one site on your list. Um, and again, we are we are working through as quickly as possible. So not we have not contacted everyone. That is correct. Okay. Um, but we are working through um, as many sites as we can uh, to try and bring them online in a, in a way that um, helps geographically disperse it through the community. But it is our intention to 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 communicate and contact folks. So what's a general timeline that we can provide them in terms of an expectation? Um, what's a general timeline? Well, I, I think uh, just, we should- just to, just to hear from you all. I'm not saying, I know every site may not be optimal and that's certainly not the expectation that I gave them, but these are folks that have been waiting for months to, you know, not obviously this is before uh, our signing the, the partnership agreement with you all but so they've been waiting is my point so i need to be able to manage their expectations so what's a reasonable time frame that they should be looking to hear from you all i will make a commitment by the end of next week we will have, um we will have talked to the, everyone on your list um and then there have been multiple mentions of data points and kind of your decision factors and things like that. And obviously I'm supportive of, us, of you all moving forward with a data-driven approach, but I would like to understand what that data is. Um, and we can do it in court or we can visit one-on-one -on -one about it. Um, all I know is when I speak to my community and I talk about our partnership with you all and that it's data-driven, that's about all I can say for right now. And I, I need to be able to tell them more than that. Absolutely, we're, we're happy to provide the back end um, information, probably okay. best because it's going to get pretty technical to, to do it one on one if that's possible or two on one. I'm happy to have the same conversation with well, any you of can't you. can't go past two on one. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, so then you also mentioned that you visited with Vinny and GK about capacity. I guess one of my concerns, <clears throat> and I know that my colleagues, uh, one or more of them have mentioned this in the past, but um, in the partnership with Optum, obviously that is supposed to assist with building capacity, but can you talk more about what does that, what does that really look like? Once, yes, we are still vaccine contingent, but if we get the vaccine in a greater um, capacity, I mean, in a greater supply, then what? Our teams uh, are built on the model of one team equals 210 vaccines a day. So um, most of our sites optimally will be about three teams. Uh, so about 630 um, a day, which is about 3000 if you do a five day. So um, if we have multiple sites running, then you just escalate it by 3000 um, per each site. Again, um, because of the types of sites that we're looking at, which will be indoors and more tailored for community efforts, mm -hmm. um, we don't 
want to go much bigger than that because we think that's going to be the best model to work within some of these communities. Um, so uh, we have the, the ability to bring on multiple sites in contingent to what GK and Vinny tell us. Um, one of the asks that we've given them is to give us a general forecast to the best of their extent and then I can back in my operational numbers to make sure if they say we can hit number X and give you that, then I can have the capacity to be able to meet that and not pull um, vaccines from the other partners that you are all working with as well too. Okay, understood. I would say in the communication strategy that you all have developed that there definitely does need to be some type of explanation of how locations are being decided. Um, I think throughout this process, I know that I've heard consistently from my constituents that they want to ensure that there's transparency in the process. And that doesn't mean that, you know, everyone's going to get a location exactly where they want it, but in explaining to people the process by which these locations were determined and the factors that are included in that, it helps for people to understand, you know, why maybe there isn't a location right up the street from them in a location that they think would course that would be great if I could go right there and get a vaccine understood yeah, yeah we we hear a lot of that same commentary as we're out in the community yeah. um, and it is a difficult it's a scarcity of resources conversation and um, our goal is to build and establish that's why our sites are um, intended to be consistent you know and long term because mm -hmm. in order to gain the trust for some of that uh, notion we're trying to spread them out in a geographically uh, uh, smart way um, that makes sense based on the data but also do it in a consistent way so folks um, feel that the local church or the local community center that they know is going to be their uh, their hub you know at least for the next eight or 12 or 16 Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, ma'am. Again, I think she has covered many of the points, and I think I would also be focused on, I think, having some sort of a, here's the way we're going, maybe some sort of a, a map that kind of shows that we're covering the entire part of the county. <coughs> um, again, as, as I indicated a few moments ago, I think we have got locations in just about every precinct with the exception of four and that's why i'm so adamant that the next one must be in precinct four up in that northwest area um and anything we can do to make that as soon as possible and i also understand that you know we can't open up a hundred of them right now with the with the scarcity of vaccines that we have and you know i i've, I've said before that i believe what we're doing right now is we're taking the scarcity of the, the scarce number of vaccines that we're getting and we're using that to train people and have them prepared to uh, be able to extend their hours and their uh, in the days of providing that and that's something that I know you're doing and you're working on so we appreciate that but I think there is also a trying to understand and making sure we agree with a balance between sites neighborhoods homebound and you know and working with us all on that because eventually we've got to allocate those vaccines to allow you to do that and so there needs to be a discussion about okay how much right now Vinny and them are pretty well doing that but if you're going to be responsible for finding the different ways to make that happen then you need to be included in that okay here's how many vaccines and, and we need to have some discussion about that. <laughs> Absolutely, and I do want to provide one other. I, I have been working with several of the local, um, and I know uh, Tarrant County Public Health as well too, but several of the local major employers um, throughout Tarrant County. Um, I'm going to call out specifically American Airlines because I have talked to them and they said I could say their name out loud uh, in Maybe. terms of their, um, their interest in um, uh, working with us in this process. Um, so. Uh, I do think that we have additional capacity as well too that the business community is looking at bringing online and we've been working in conjunction with all of them. So when we do get eligibility and we do get vaccines, um, you could see a significant uptick because I think some of the business community might take sh and shoulder some of this burden. David, I, think, I appreciate you bringing that up because you're exactly right. I've had conversations with American as well as and have suggested that they, and they told me that they were in communication with you, mm -hmm. which is what it should, that's the way it should happen. 
There are other major employers, as you've mentioned, that have previously expressed interest in doing that, so I applaud that approach to, again, it, but it, at some point, whether again individually or whether you bring that to the court as a whole, that's why it is going to be important that we all understand that there's two or three or four or five different ways that we're planning on getting shots in the arms uh, and have all of those ready to go if and when we get um, a large number of the vaccines. And it may end up changing our whole approach to not only those folks who have already gotten their first shot um, when it comes to how do we how do we get them their second shot. Absolutely, and uh, I will say we've had a, a wonderful working relationship with uh, GK and Vinny uh, in this process. So I, I see that, uh, I'm not a big fan of the word synergy, but the word synergy there um, between what we're doing and all of our efforts. Any other questions of David or um, I've got one final. This is in the meeting where we talk about the data. Um, in the, a recent Texas Tribune article, a member of your staff, I guess your director of, Tex, of the Texas Center for Health Disparities. Um, Dr. Vishwanatha. Vishwanatha, yes. I'd like for Dr. Vishwanatha to be part of that meeting. Uh, absolutely, I will um, uh, do my best, Courtney. Okay, thank you. Thank we you. thank the University of North Texas Health Science Center for uh, what you're doing to reach out into all parts of Tarrant County. And I understand the frustration uh, of not having enough vaccine to <coughs> actualize the whole plan at one time, but we know it's coming. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Members of court, we can now go to a presentation by uh, Mr. Tanasia. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. So uh, I wish they had stayed because uh, there's just big news that came out that uh, state is deciding March 29th, next Monday, no more restrictions. Vaccine is going to be open for everybody. Yes, I know. I know. It's break, breaking news just now. So. Uh, we're excited about that. They, they've heard feedback from us, uh, and they understand that all this restriction is sort of getting in the way. Um, so that's great news. Um, so we'll, we'll work with them to kind of figure out the logistics and how to get it all going. So. Yeah, I just fair and great news. I, I, I think that is great. That just reiterates my comment regarding the call-in, yeah. our, our, our call center. They need to be prepared to convert to a there's no reason to register them. Well, so <laughs> unless you want big lines. <laughs> well, I'm not saying I want big yeah. lines at all. Right, it still right. will be appointment yeah. only. Yes. But why should we register someone as opposed to give them an appointment? That's part of the, the appointment process, right? So you can have registrations ahead of time. So you can call an invited capacity. And you can open up on-site appointment for people that walk in. It just makes things a lot easier. We can do it both ways. Let we us work out the logistics. About it yes, because sir. Because yes. I see, first off, I will not be in favor of walk-in. Uh -huh. Because that creates hours of waiting, and yes. we've got too good of a reputation to do that. <laughs> but I do believe that we can have an organized call-in, get you an appointment, yes. and be there. It may be an appointment two weeks from now, but that should give them flexibility not only in when they come, but where they go. We'll and have to work through all of that. Let, let's kind of absorb it, and then we'll come back to you with, with some planning on how to do that. What was that date again? Uh, March 29th, next Monday. Because um, I have people registered in the database that were not eligible, and now they are. So th they kind of get priority because they waited so long after they registered. So, But we'll, we'll work through all of that, no problem. OK, so first, the COVID vaccine situational awareness. Um, so 249,000 cases, and we're, we're still in the decline, 3,226 deaths. And finally, all of North Texas is pretty much green, so I'm very happy about that, that we're trending down. We're below 5% uh, hospitalizations with COVID in Tarrant County. Uh, that's 218 people in the hospital. 40, 43 of those were in ICU. That's 11.88%. And we have 70 ICU beds available. 
trauma service area E, which is the MAP, 4.53% uh, hospitalizations uh, with COVID. Just for my own information, what's going on in Rock? I think they're just uh, hospitals may be limited in capacity. They're, they may not have enough hospital capacity, so even smaller numbers are looking like their capacity is used up. They may not be a very big hospital county, right? They're a small county. So, uh, Smallest county geographically. Right. Um, they might, I don't know how many hospitals they have, but they might have only one. <laughs> so uh, 225 uh, beds available and only 693 uh, patients with confirmed COVID in the 19 county region. So it's great news. And the chart on the bottom is the map from the, uh, or the bar graph from the state dashboard. So continue to be declining. Although if you look carefully, the last bar edged up a little, and there, there's a reason why I'm worried about that. Um, this is good, like our cases and our death rates declining, but let me get to where I'm worried. <laughs> so two weeks since Texas is fully open, right? And, and it does have an impact. So we were declining very rapidly on our positivity rate, and for the last three or four days, it's starting to tick up. So we hit a pandemic low of 5%, we're back up to 7%. If you look at the red arrow on the hospitalizations in, in Tarrant County, it's kind of hard to tell, but there's a little curl up, right? It's not going down anymore. It's just call it flat. Um, and then the, the spread rate has increased a little. We were down to almost like 0.52 and we're back at 0.88. Now anything below one, that means the virus is slowing down. So we're still in a downtrend. But if you start to look at the impact of Texas reopening, that is already starting to be visible. Now we're worried about what is spring break going to do? I mean, the news coverage has been just alarming. I mean, Miami Beach had to put a, a curfew on because there were just too many people crowding together. If you watch coverage, there's no breathing room. People were just crowded for blocks. When they go home, we're gonna potentially have some problems, hopefully not big spikes, but I'm worried that we're gonna lose some of this ground that we've gained, that, that's the concern. So that's where we are, but you know, overall, we're still in a downtrend, so that's great news. I don't wanna take that away. We've got a lot of pos positive developing, so let's keep it that way. Um, and again, uh, our case rate is below 100 per 100,000, and we're below 10% positivity, so we're officially back out of the red zone, because you know, that's two independent variables that we look at. Okay, so that's all the, the disease coverage. Um, and then again, the messaging remains the same, regardless of what happens, whether there's an order or not, we should wear a mask, six foot distancing. Now there's some guidance out from CDC about schools in particular, about being able to go to a three foot social distancing. It's a little nuanced, right? Nothing is straightforward that everybody do three feet. So elementary schools, they're saying kids are doing better. They wear masks, they follow rules, all that kind of stuff. And it's, it's found in their data that there's not a whole lot of spread, so they can go three feet. In middle and high school, there's a lot of nuances there. You know, six feet in certain situations if your community has a high spread and if they can't be congregated, which happens a lot in high school setting because they're going between classes, they've got social activities, they've got sports activities. So it's, it's kind of worth reading and understanding. It's not a blanket three feet for all. And then adults in a school setting, teachers, school staff, maintain six foot distance, wear a mask. So, you know, it is what it is. It's not straightforward. So in my view, six foot still applies. Uh, and then avoid large crowds. Don't go to Miami Beach <laughs> for spring break. Uh, and then continue to wash your hands throughout the day. Okay. So. Now for the vaccine update, and I know our schedule is starting to get very complicated, but there's been a lot of requests coming for a comprehensive view. So my apologies for it being so busy, but we have four sites still that are public health uh, run where we are present in, in person with staff. So Resource Connection, Hearst, Conference Center, Bob Bolin, and Farrington or Billingsley uh, drive through And you know, there's some minor changes. For example, we will be closed at the resource connection on Thursday this week. Um, and Farrington Field, we kept closed yesterday because there were weather-related concerns, rain and lightning was a concern. Um, and and they're, you know, Fort Worth is involved, so they have their own plan for safety and things like that. So 
we're kind of working with that. Um, overall, generally, it's the same. Uh, there's not much difference. Um, Bob Bolin is still operating one day, which was yesterday, and the rest of the day, we're, we're keeping it closed. So generally, the same plan. Uh, we're still not at full capacity, but you know, we're, we're OK. We're getting our vaccine out. Now, the new site you heard this morning was at the, uh, the Brighter Outlook facility for the Ebenezer Church. Uh, I believe, Commissioner Brooks, did you make a visit this morning there? I did. Yes, sir. So, um, you know, they're, they're working with us, and uh, as you heard, that their current goal is to have 210 a day out this week, but we're going to ramp up next week. We're already having email conversations and trying to get more vaccine done there. Globe Life, which was a FEMA location, is now closed because they did their three weeks of first doses there. To do the second doses, they moved over to the Arlington facility at eSports. So they're doing their second doses out of there. And they, they operate there, I believe, till April 8th. And then starting on the 9th, they shift over to the AT&T Stadium. Now what their plan is, they will be there for 10 days or two weeks. 19th and they're going to do mostly Johnson and Johnson from the 9th and the 19th because there's not enough time to come back and do a second dose so it's a little complicated on how it's being done it's availability of the site Globe Life could only operate so long AT&T wasn't available so they went to eSports and then they're going to AT&T to sort of finish off but first three weeks Pfizer first doses Next three weeks, Pfizer second doses. The last two weeks, mostly Johnson and Johnson, single dose vaccine. Vinny, when you would you add a column on this particular worksheet that indicates what type of vaccinations they're giving from those sites? It is not always as easy. I mean, it, we can try, but it's not always the same because it just depends on what comes. So we switch on a on a day to day basis, and and it gets mixed into some people are coming due for second doses of Pfizer. And first doses we're doing Moderna, so sometimes it's running both. So uh, I'll try, but it may not be very easy to follow. Just try. Yes, sir. And then the rest of the sites, we, we added on. Uh, you asked for THR to be shown and how they're operating. Uh, MedStar has a couple of sites that they're going to do this week, uh, mobile clinics. One is going to be at the Hanley Meadowbrook Community Center, I believe, on the 24th. Uh, that's first doses. Their goal is to do about 1,000. And they were already trying a sort of a pop-up registration type of deal where people can come in, register on site. Um, next week, I think it's going to be more common all across the county and all across the state as, as these restrictions come. <coughs> and they're getting their vaccine straight from the state. Yes, sir, they are. The yeah, Medstar is getting it. Yes, sir. And then on the 26th, they're doing a second dose clinic at the Como Community Center. So I wanted to make sure you all are aware. Um, and then we did add a new partner. <coughs> I don't know how long they will operate, but they're focused in mostly on cancer patients. It's the, uh, the, cancer, the Center for Cancer and Blood Disorders. They're on Magnolia Avenue in, in Fort Worth. And they've done, a, I think, close to like 1,000 doses last week. And they're doing some more this week. Uh, so their operations are there. <coughs> all right. Um, so that's all I have on the scheduling. Um, Overall vaccine update, again, just a reminder, this is data from last Wednesday. Uh, we try, but we don't always get the updated info from DSHS to be able to give you the latest. Um, so 508,000 doses delivered across the county. And the data is for all providers, whatever DSHS provides. We do fill in some gaps with, if their data is running behind seven or eight days, we, we put in the recent data that we know so that we have the most comprehensive picture. And then 339,000 first doses delivered, 171,000 series completed. So now, just for clarification, in the first doses delivered, there's Johnson & Johnson, which was, at least the last I knew, 4,500 or so. And then in the series completed, there's also Johnson & Johnson. So it's sort of double counted. Those numbers are not going to add up to the total. But it's just how even CDC is now presenting it the same way. So we sort of mirrored after what they're doing. Uh, that way we know who's, how many are fully vaccinated. So 8% of the county is currently fully vaccinated. Um, and then as you can see on the maps, where most of the vaccine distribution is happening. Again, it ties into how people are registering. So we need to continue to work on getting more people signed up to get the vaccine so we can, we can get them uh, addressed. But the restrictions coming off are going to help with a lot of things because now we can speed up and not have to for example, in our database, 100 and 
2,000 or so people registered, some in December, January, February, still waiting because they were not eligible. Now it will be registered, you're eligible, let's go. So it will be a lot easier. Um, and this is just uh, sign-ups and, and things are improving. As you can see, the colors are getting deeper and deeper. More and more people are uh, signing up. So that's great news. And then the final, here's the breakdown on uh, race, ethnicity, and, and other demographics. Um, I wanted to point out that the, the 50 to 64 age group, that was category 1C, that just became open a couple, three weeks ago, a huge chunk of those folks did get vaccinated. Um, part of that was they were also part of the folks that were in 1B, underlying health conditions, so that some of them were already vaccinated, but the category restriction coming off helped increase those numbers very significantly. So that's a, a big chunk. What I do know is that it's not the entire eligible population. Like, we have almost 300,000 people in Tarrant County. I don't think they all got vaccinated. So now that the restrictions are coming off, the message is going to be everybody's eligible. Sign up so you can receive your vaccine appointment really quick. Um, the uh, percentages are improving and on race and ethnicity. Register once. Yes, sir. Register only once. <laughs> um, so African American, uh, you know, percentage is now at nine percent, which is great. Every one percentage point makes a huge difference. And then, of course, uh, Latino community at ten percent. So more work to be done. But I think part of the issue is the ethnicity data is not reported very well. Um, some people just identify as white and don't fill in the Latino, his, you know, Hispanic ethnicity. So there's a lot of unreported data on that as well. Okay, so final slide, a little bit more boiled down version from last week. You saw the details, now it's kind of just a summary. Um, so overall, 418,000 doses given by public health and partner operations. Uh, so mostly public health run sites, Arlington, or some clinical partners like THR, Baylor, and, and others that report back. Um, and then we have uh, key metrics, 504,000 people in our system have been called for an appointment or have been transferred to a partner and supposedly they called for an appointment. Uh, we're still working through all of those details. As of this morning, there were 42,000 people, you know, pending an appointment that are currently <clears throat> eligible. And as you can see, 102,000 were future eligible, which will become eligible on Monday. So that's still a good number that we're going to have to work through over the next couple, three weeks. But that's where we are, and I'll be happy to answer any questions or any details on this. Vinny, back on the Center for Cancer and Blood, is that one that we're overseeing? Uh, no, we're not. Uh, in, they're independent providers, sir. But they wanted to take people off our registry that were cancer patients. So we gave them that. I think uh, we transferred a uh, 1,500 or so names. So we're, they worked through that. So just trans they got their vaccines. They're another one that got their vaccines they, from the state. They got some from the state, and they got some transferred in from the city of Arlington. So it's kind of been a mix of both. Because they had more people they wanted to do. They had capacity. But the state gave them like one time 100 doses, another time 300 doses. And they said, well, we have our patients. We can take people off your list. So we got them a little bit of a help from Arlington. When did they open up? I uh, believe last week was the first week they ran. And this week is the second week. Okay. And they were not open all of last week. Uh, no, sir. Uh, I think the partial week the, their sites were running. So uh, I don't know how long they're going to operate, maybe two, three weeks, because they were very focused in on cancer patients. And in our database, we had a huge number at one time, but they were given appointments and, and got done. So those numbers are dwindling also. And Vinny, was that not the group that came out to Resource yes, sir, Connection did. and watched how we were doing yes, sir. that are conducting that process? Yes, sir. Several weeks they've been trying to kind of work and find out how to get vaccines. So they, they're a good partner. I mean, they've done a good job. They did a drive through on their site as well. I do understand that. Northwest. Vinny? It's an independent site. I'm not Vinny? opening these. <laughs> I'm not opening these. But you put vaccines in those. No. So they, they came from Arlington. That's not a that's not a transfer. Arlington made the transfer. I just connected the two partners. Otherwise, Arlington was saying we want to give vaccine to somebody. I was like, okay, well they're asking. You give them some. Could you no. not have set up a Northwest clinic to give them some? Well, I need the logistics and Vinny? the people there. I, I don't have the people power, but you know, we're working with the UNT to get there. Yes, sir. 
This site was coming open independently. They ran their site already with their own drive-through and their own patients with their own vaccine. They just wanted to do more and we connected the two partners to open up a brand new site. We will work with UNT, we'll, we'll get you a new site. No problem. We're, you we're... keep telling me no problem. <laughs> There's going to be a problem if you don't get a northwest side. Open. I understand. Yes, sir. <laughs> Loud and clear. We, we got it. <laughs> I, I, I don't, you know, I will make sure UNT is fully aware of your comment. That's all I can tell. You better tell me there's a northwest side open pretty quick. We're going, we're going to work to ensure that we implement that strategy. We'll get those open. I'll work with Mr. Manning. We'll, we'll come up with the sites across the, across, across the county. I hear you. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions? Yeah. So, Vinny, the, this summary is very simple, and now I'm lost. When you presented this last <laughs> week, I followed it all. So, will you go back to that? And I want to make sure that I understand where it says TCPH run. Will you go back to that slide? Oh, yes, ma'am. Okay, so this TCPH run is the very same as last week where it just said TCPH, right? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Arlington, FEMA Arlington, clinical partner is everybody else. And then for the key metrics, which you said that they have appointment, this is everyone that was offered an appointment, but they may not have actually showed up for it. They may have canceled it or rescheduled or whatever, right? When you Tell me that part again. So on the TCPH run numbers, that's doses administered. That's what we know that we've already given out. Yeah. To get to that 192,000 number, we've given out a lot more appointments because people cancel, they don't show, things happen. So of the, the 504 have appointment, then 418 have been. Yes, but there's a little bit wrinkle there. So it's actually 269 because those 504 are technically what we call first appointments issued. Okay. But it's a it's kind of a when you break down into it, you can take away 60,000 right off the bat because those are appointments that are issued for this week in our system. Okay. So those folks haven't yet come. Okay. But the appointments are issued because we work on the schedule on the weekend. So it's the numbers are showing that there's an appointment issued, but it's throughout this week. And then several of those are actually transferred to a provider, but the way our system records it, okay, we gave like 25,000 to THR, so in our system it's showing an appointment issued because they're supposed to give okay. them an appointment. Okay, you said that Yes. Last okay. Yeah. So okay. It, it gets a little not, sure. not so clean. <laughs> okay. No, 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 I, okay, yeah. that, that is reconciled in my head now. Um, the second thing that I had, and maybe this, I don't know if this will be addressed by the opening eligibility, but I had a constituent who received a vaccine elsewhere in Texas because that's where she was for work. And then her work assignment ended. She came back home to Tarrant County and she's been struggling to try to find where to get that second dose. So how I'm assuming that this is not an isolated event, right? It is other not. people would have the same issue. Yeah. What can we do about that? Uh, I'm I, working I with the team to there. come up with a solution. Our worry is that if we say, okay, anybody second dose folks come in, I mean, literally I, I was answering some emails, somebody reached out to the judge's office, similar situation. Mm -hmm. um, it, we have a counted number of doses. You gave 10,000 doses for first shots, you're gonna get 10,000 doses for second shots. So now I say I can do second shots for somebody else's clients, they come and they get their second shot, but my 10,000 people may not get the vaccine from me. Now that it's becoming open, it's going to happen because with most other vaccines, we don't even worry about it. You get your first dose at the doctor's office, second dose at public health, third dose in series you might get at a local pharmacy. People don't even think about it because it's so widely available. There's this not one. A third dose. Don't well, no, no, I'm just saying in, in other series of vaccines. Well, I understand that, yes, but don't say yeah. third yeah. dose with this because you'll right. have everybody yes, lighten up our phones. <laughs> so, you know, in this one, the issue is that it's so limited capacity in, on the vaccine availability that if we open that up, it creates some other logistical challenges. Now, there have been providers that have had issues we've transferred 50 doses here, 30 doses there to rescue a provider saying, okay, you ran out of doses, sure, we'll, we'll do that. 
we're working with a team to see how to make it logistically possible so we can make it work. It's not there yet, but hopefully in a week or so we'll, we'll come up with a solution. Okay. Um, and I don't know if, if we have some statement on our, our public health website that makes it really clear that you need to, where you get your first dose, you need to go back for your second dose. And maybe in this instance, it still would have been this, that same issue even if, you know, the expectation had been set that you need to go wherever you got your first dose, get your second dose. But it was pointed out in this constituent's frustration is that she went to the website. She didn't see that anywhere. So I think we need to work Well, on let, me, let me work through. Okay. Part of the reason we hesitate to do that, multiple years of public health training, we don't want to be a barrier in the way of getting a series completed. Yeah. So I've had to fight with this sort of mixed emotion about what are we doing, right? I mean, sure. from a public health standpoint, yeah, you're eligible, you want your second vaccine, let's get your series completed. But from a logistics <coughs> standpoint, staff are like, how do we manage this? Right. So we're, we're, we're kind of caught in the middle, we'll, we'll fix it. <laughs> I understand. Yeah. Thank you, Benny. Yep. All right. Thank what you. What kind of a no-show rate are we having on our second vaccines? Second vaccines are pretty good. Uh, usually about 97, 98% people show up. So people are serious about completing their series. But again, that gives each location a little bit. Wiggle room, yes. A wiggle room on that. And so mm -hmm. as we begin to open up more, I think we need to have a system in place that says <coughs> how do we reconcile and if we have to transfer because we had an inordinate amount. I mean, a lot of people, as the two that I've mentioned, had your office or talked with you in your office this morning, you know, 95 and 91, um, walking is a big issue. And so if they can just go by and get shot through a drive through or something along that lines, to them that's much more manageable than having to get out and walk even 10 or 15 feet, let alone 1,500 or so. Yes. Now, at the FEMA sites, they do have a lot of soldiers pushing them on wheelchairs and whatnot. So that's part of the reason we, we worked with that site. They specifically asked for these folks that had disabilities or, or just other issues where there was mobility challenges. Um, so they're really prepared for it. I understand that, but obviously they yeah. didn't explain that well enough on the first one because they walked on the first one. Mm. Yes, sir. And so that's why I'm saying we're all getting calls well, why do I have to go to Globe Life Park when there's a place right next door to me at, in Hearst or right next door to me at TCU? And so, you know, depending upon how difficult it is to reconcile and transfer, if we, you know, what happens to the second doses that they don't use? So second doses that are not on the first appointment call, right? So 98% of the people show up on the next several days, those people continue to show up. At some point, we'll, we'll kind of look at all the data, series completion. Currently, it's kind of hard to tell because we're several weeks behind on, on that. Uh, you know, there's always a gap, but we'll, we'll do some analysis on what is our series completion rate actually. Uh, my guess would be we're hitting pretty close to like 99% because I don't think people are missing their second doses because we get called all the time. I missed my appointment, can I come? Yes, you can. You, you had your appointment three days ago, just come on in. Well, but, I mean, that's kind of where if you look at your uh, vaccine update, you know, that's probably not it. Number of vaccine first doses, at least one first dose, 339,000, 171,000 fully vaccinated. Without question, I can guarantee you that in the last three to four weeks, we have not had, or, and even going back, I'm not sure we had uh, 160,000 folks that were given. So that it would seem to me like we got a lot of second doses running around here someplace that hadn't been putting somebody's off. Yeah, I'd have to go look at all of that on how account for all of that. It, it's not it's not just sitting around. I mean, I can tell you that. It gets used. Well, I, uh, I, I yeah. know that, but yes, what sir. I'm saying is, is it should be 
we might be able to make it available. We need to try to make it as convenient as possible. Yes, sir. And we're, we're going to get there. I mean, pharmacies are coming on board. There's, once vaccine becomes available, this is a non-issue. Public health would be the first one. Let's get your series completed because that's what we do for other vaccines. Yeah, I would, I would say our success rate will be when we can put everything into, as TK has said earlier, many times, the success rate will be when you go to your pharmacy to get whatever you need. Yes. And you're not, we're not having to do the big clinics anymore. Yes, sir. Okay. Any other questions for Vinny? Thank you, Vinny. Thank, Thank you. Vinny. Board members, if we could move to item number two in the administrator section. This is a letter requesting that Tarrant County be included in HB 1240. 1240 basically is a bracket bill that would um, allow uh, violations of an order of the fire marshal to be, uh, to allow the fire marshal to issue a class C a citation for those for those violations currently uh, it's a class b violation except in harris county harris county has the ability to issue citations on a class c and typical that you find in the legislature you have brackets and uh, talking with uh, our fire marshal and other fire marshals uh, uh, there's a request that they lower those brackets to include uh, counties such as tarrant county approval mm -hmm. Second. We have a motion to second. Any discussion? Please vote. Commissioner Johnson. Commissioner Johnson. He said yes. <laughs> Thank motion you. passes unanimously. Item three and four, Ms. Camarano is going to make that presentation. Good morning. Good morning. Just barely. Good morning. All right, before I get into just these couple of brief slides, I did want to share with you that we're very close to wrapping up our CARES CRF funded rental assistance program. We've now made it through all applications um, and have assisted uh, 2,303 unique households so far um, to the tune of about $7.7 .7 million. Um, we do anticipate sending, or we will be sending our final uh, payments to the auditor's office uh, this Friday, and so you'll see the final uh, payments come through on the claims addendums over the next few weeks. So moving in, how many I'm sorry. Unique households was that again? Uh, so far, 2,303, okay. um, with another probably 150 pending over the next few weeks. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I won't go into a lot of details about this program because I have done that for you previously, um, but I would like to announce that we'll be launching um, the Emergency Rental Assistance Program, which I'll refer to as ERAP, uh, next Monday, March 29th. Um, we have three tools that will be in place to assist us with that launch. That's GetRentHelp.com, um, and that's the screening portal that I've uh, gone into detail with you previously. Uh, the Neighborly Application Portal, and then our AnswerNet Call Center uh, to support uh, the calls for this program. Uh, the program will provide assistance for unpaid overdue and future rents, and unpaid overdue and current utility bills, including Internet. Up to 12 months of assistance will be provided for those who qualify with an additional three months for a total of up to 15 months uh, if necessary for housing stability. Um, there are some details about all of these things outlined in the full policy document that was included with your court communication. Uh, recertification of income will be required in all cases every three months and that's a departure from last year's program which required uh, recertification every month. Um, Kristen, I just wanted to thank you for getting um, clarification on what is a utility, and I'm glad to see that internet is an eligible utility. That's yes. really important. So great. Thank you. Yes, you're welcome. Okay. So eligibility and prioritization. So the eligibility criteria, um, it, there are three major uh, eligibility criteria. The first is that the applicant or household must have qualified for unemployment or have experienced a reduction in income or have experienced a financial hardship due to COVID-19. 
They must have demonstrated a risk of experiencing homelessness or housing instability, uh, which is evidenced by having at least one month of past due rent. Um, you will probably see other programs uh, announced over the next few weeks. Many of them are, are using two months or more. Um, we feel like one month is adequate to, to uh, demonstrate that risk. Um, and then have a household income at or below 80% AMI. And I've also shared that chart with you in your document. Application review and assistance will be prioritized through our software based on three criteria. This allows us to um, assist the most vulnerable uh, first. This is a, a requirement of the Treasury and our software uh, provider has worked with us to build this into the application process. Current eviction notice or case is awarded five points. Uh, if the applicant has been unemployed for 90 days or more, they're awarded five points. And if they have a household income at or below 50% AMI, they're awarded 10 points. We then go through and sort them based on points and assign cases uh, to the most vulnerable first. So that is my update. I said it would be brief. If you have any questions about the policy document included, um, I'm happy to, to answer those, but I will go ahead and ask for uh, court approval of the policy and guidelines document uh, included in the court communication for the Emergency Rental Assistance Program. I will move approval with the comment that this ERAP program is a lot more comprehensive and cuts out a lot of the gray areas that we saw in the original CARES Act funding. Um, and the addition of the mediation component uh, is a tremendous benefit in helping bring landlords and tenants together. Um, I'll second and also just express my thanks. I know this has been a journey with our CRF program, a lot of lessons learned, we saw success there, but being able to take those lessons and so that we could stand up a, um, continue to stand up a good program, so. We have a motion and second. Any further discussion? Please vote. Commissioner Johnson? Yes. Motion passes unanimously. Thank you. And then the next agenda item is a request for approval of interim financing for grant year 2020 U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development tenant-based leasing assistance 114, 3CP, and HOPWA. Um, occasionally, the timing on grant awards is off. I'm sure you guys are familiar with this. And so we are asking for uh, approval to provide interim financing to some of our subrecipient agencies to fill that gap. Move for approval. Second. second. We have a motion and a second. Any discussion? <coughs> vote. Commissioner Johnson? Yes. Motion passes unanimously. Thank you all. Thank you, Commissioner. Ms. Glenn. Move to receive and file the personnel agenda. Second. We have a motion and a second to receive and file the personnel agenda. Please vote. Uh, Commissioner Johnson? Yes. Motion passes unanimously. Good morning and thank you. Good morning. Good morning. We have just uh, one additional item, that's item two. We're asking the court to approve a waiver for purchasing. Um, Ms. Lee is requesting a waiver of 384 vacation hours. That is down from 400 hours, effective April 3rd. Her software specialist is leaving county service at the end of this month. It's her only position um, like it in her department. We are estimating a net cost to the general fund of approximately $4,000. That does include fringe benefits. Uh, uh, just a side note, we are anticipating that this cost will be offset by departmental-wide salary savings. Move for approval. Second. Sorry. We have a motion and a second. Any discussion? Please vote. Commissioner Johnson? Yes. Motion passes unanimously. Thank you. Thank you. Melissa? Good morning. Good morning. Uh, we have two items for your approval. Uh, the first item is an award recommendation for bid number 2021-045. The annual, this is um, the Arlington Sub Courthouse generator fuel tank replacement for facilities management. <clears throat> Excuse me awarding to KW Power Services in the amount of $17,780. Uh, 
if approved, we're also requesting contract approval, and this has been uh, approved by our project manager, um, Beard, Hampton, and Brown. Move for approval. Second. We have a motion to second. Any discussion? Please vote. Commissioner Johnson? Yes. Motion passes unanimously. The second item is also an award recommendation for bid number 2021065. This is an annual contract for the purchase of tractors and boom mowers, awarding to the various vendors listed in the court communique per unit price. Move for approval. Second. We have a motion to second. Any discussion? Please vote. Commissioner Johnson? Yes. Motion passes unanimously. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, appointments today. I have one on the uh, historical uh, conference uh, committee. Uh, Brent Hyder, 4900 Bryce Avenue, Fort Worth. Second. We have a motion to second. Any discussion? Please vote. Commissioner Johnson? Yes. Motion passes unanimously. Moving on the uh, for the claims including the addendum. Move approval of the claims including the addendum. Second. I have a motion to second to approve the claims including the addendum. Please vote. Commissioner Johnson? Yes. Motion passes unanimously. Uh, Mr. Manius. Okay. Your Honor, members of the court, we just have one additional briefing item. This is the legislative update. Uh, Mr. Schaffner has provided you with a memorandum um, dealing with uh, his update uh, just to point out a few issues that he has highlighted. Uh, there's different legislative or bills being introduced as it relates to defunding local governments, as it relates to local law enforcement budgets. Uh, there, I believe there are five of those bills. We're working to try to get some greater clarity and to express some of the concerns that we have as it relates to those particular bills. Uh, there are also uh, <clears throat> seven different pieces of legislation that deal with tax and expenditure limitations. I think the one that, um, that um, I'm sorry, that, and that deals also with, um, with some of these are for the non or the funding issue and what happens, some of the penalties for defunding law enforcement. Uh, one thing that mm -hmm. I wanted to point out, and I believe that uh, the tax assessor collector had pointed this out uh, a week or so ago, there is a, a provision that, um, that it's the registration of motor vehicles and to be able to register a motor vehicle in any county that you want it to register, which, be, which would be a significant fiscal impact on the county if something like that happened. We're trying to, um, to we're trying to make an effort to refine that bill to the point that there's not a uh, fiscal impact to counties if something like that would happen. And so these, all of these bills are, are currently in the mix and uh, we've had some hearings those last couple of days. Um, but there's more hearings to come. I want to make sure that uh, Mr. Shafter communicates with each and every one of you on greater details. That way it will give you an opportunity to ask him directly as to um, any specific questions that you might have. With that, I'll be more than happy to try to answer any questions as it relates to this particular item. Thank you, Your Honor. Okay, uh, now I'll, I want to go back to the nomination for just a second, not the legislative thing. We have talked about making the nominations for our transportation <coughs> thing today. I've, I've got one, but I'm not ready to make all three. And one of the questions that I would like to resolve is the chairmanship. I would like to uh, suggest that we, um, that we appoint and approve the chairman of the committee, and then each one of us appoint our three. That will give us a total of 16. Um, somebody said, well, that's an even number. If, if it comes up to be eight and eight, then we probably don't need to be doing the project. Um, and I would like, as I had mentioned earlier, I would, I would like to consider, and, and what I'll do is I'll put it out there, and then if it doesn't, if it doesn't go anywhere, it doesn't go anywhere. But I would like to nominate Victor Vandergrift, who is the executive director of our TRTC, 
to be the chairman of the committee and um, then maybe by next week we can all have our three from that standpoint. So uh, I'll make that the formal of a motion. I'll second that. So discussion? I think Victor would do a very fair and very thorough job. Helping very us knowledgeable. I agree. Okay. Um, is there any so further next, discussion? Next week we're doing the appointments, though, because I think we, we sent our names. Um, so then, but it's on the agenda next week, right? Right. Okay. Well, we, it's on the agenda any week because it's under appointments. So um, I, just, I, I just know I am missing uh, two right now. Okay. And so if we could, you know, if we could all make an effort to have it ready, and all y'all may already have all yours. I got mine. You got yours. So I'm I have mine. Next week is fine. I'm one. So do y'all want to go ahead? Why don't we, we, let's go ahead and list the ones we've got. Randy, do you have the list? I do Actually, I've heard from uh, pretty much all the port members except we have one remaining. I just need to get the yours, uh, actually. <laughs> so, uh, like I said, I've been a little derelict about doing that. I'm sorry. So I'll have mine by next week. But why don't we go ahead and let's list the, the other 12 and then. I don't have that list in front of me, but. Uh, okay, do we want to just. do that next, next week. week. Okay, we'll just do it next week then. Um, we have a motion and a second regarding the chair. Um, have you discussed this with Victor? Yes, and he said he would. <laughs> good question. <laughs> It is a good, and I have been known to appoint people to certain things without no, confirming the fact that they would do that. <laughs> but occasionally. Only, okay. In fact, he was one of the first ones that I did that to when we put him on the NTTA, I believe. Judge, uh, may I just clarify this? You're, the committee now will be made up of 16 Correct. Uh, members. Okay. And Victor will be the chair of the committee and sure. will have vote and everything mm -hmm. else and that's from that standpoint. But Very good. Please vote. Commissioner Johnson? Yes. Motion passes unanimously. Okay. Uh, That's all that we have at, at this time. Okay. We do have a closed session, though. Then with that, we will recess our open meeting to proceed to close to discuss items exempted under Section 551. <laughs> Why is it always so darn cold up here? Uh, because we've left the room and we haven't had a chance for our hot air to warm it back up. <laughs> Having returned from our closed session, there being no business to conduct at this time, we stand adjourned.